Great. Well, so good to have you here. Uh, my name is Martin. Uh, allow me to extend a warm welcome to you, particularly if you are here as a guest, a visitor, if you've come because somebody invited you to come. We're so thrilled that you're here tonight. We've been doing this service throughout today. This is our final one, and this is the best one of all. So there we are. Uh, you chose the best one to come to. Well, I hope you do well. Uh, who is looking forward to Christmas or, or by now? Kind of feeling, feeling it, feeling it. Hopefully tonight has helped a little bit. Um, I was going to begin tonight by saying something about the World Cup, but I kind of, <laughs> I think I'm probably just best to leave it, yeah? Well, just, we just move on. I just do want to know, are there any Morocco fans out there? And I feel like, haven't we all just become brand new Morocco fans now for the, for the rest of the tournament? I know I have. So um, anyway, there we are. Well, on a cheerier note, this week I came across uh, a survey of the top 40 things that make British people happy. And uh, it made me smile, some things that hopefully... Uh, would resonate with you. Uh, things like a, a nice sunset. Do you like a nice sunset? Um, the, the smell of freshly baked bread. Oh, yes, yes. The sound of a baby laughing. Do we like that? that that's quite popular. Um, in fact, there were quite a few things relating to babies and children. One of the things was um, somebody bringing a baby into work, which I was a bit like, do people, you know, if someone asked you what makes you happy, I mean, does this happen a lot? It's like, you know, I kind of think about, oh, yeah, I know I love, what I love, love nothing better than a baby being brought to work. I also thought, um, depends a bit what your job is, doesn't it? If you're a midwife, I'm not sure you want any more babies. Do you want any, do you want more babies? Maybe you do. Um, so one of them was um, getting through all green lights. Yeah, we love any kind of drivers, just love getting through all green. But you know, if that was the thing that makes you most happy, um, I think maybe there's something wrong, you know, like if, if that's, maybe you're in a big rush, I'm not sure. As I said, a lot of things about children, one of them was having a child draw a picture of you. Maybe you're a proud grandparent or, or parent. For me, my children drawing pictures of me, it's been a mixed experience, I've got to be honest. Um, there's one here, which was, I think, the, the, the most recent one done by one of my children who's here in the service now. Um, Admittedly, I had stubble at the time. Maybe I had gained a few pounds. Um, I'm not sure how happy I felt about that. Um, one of the things was uh, old couples holding hands. We like that, don't we? And any old couples here tonight? I, you, you're going to have to self-declare. Oh, Jim, right, right here on the front row. Because I, I, like, I don't want to get sued. So I, I mean, I was thinking of you, but I didn't want to say it. Um, so... Um, would you be willing to stand and hold hands for us? That'll make us all happy. Come on, Jill. Come on, Jill. Look, just, just turn around, because just turn around for a moment, because you've made everyone happy now. So thank you. Thank you for that. That's absolutely beautiful. Uh, wonderful thing. Number 14 on the list simply said cake. And number 13 said somebody telling you that you've lost weight. And I was like, well, you can't have it both ways, can you? I'm not, I don't know. Uh, maybe you can. Uh, you probably want to know the top three. Number three was getting into uh, fresh uh, bed sheets. Like, you know, like getting into your bed with fresh sheets. Do we like that? Oh, yes. Some teenagers going, I don't understand that one. Um, uh, number two was, was setting off on holiday. That, oh, we're going on holiday feeling. And remember, this was a British survey. Uh, number one was waking up on a summer's day to a clear blue sky. Yeah, some of you going, I can't remember what that, what that was like. Uh, another thing I came across this week made me smile, particularly in the face of cost of living, was the three wise men arriving at the stable. In fact, I think we can see a picture of this and saying, just to be perfectly clear, these gifts are for both birth, your birthday and Christmas. And uh, I'm sure if you've got a birthday anywhere near Christmas, you understand the big joint present idea. Well, you can have it, but it's going to be for birthday and Christmas. Um, well, obviously, I want to take a few minutes to speak about the Christmas message today. Um, I, I'm, so I, I'm kind of qualify with the, the kind of the older generation. I grew up in the 70s, so uh, kids' entertainment in those days was kind of very basic. Uh, but you didn't get uh, out of childhood when I was growing up without you did dot to dot. I don't know, does, I don't know if we, do we still just, does that still happen? 
dot to dot. It's where, what it is if you don't know, does it, just give me a wave if you know what dot to dot is. Okay, okay, most of us, that's good. So basically it's where lots of dots are on a page and they're numbered and you kind of draw one to two, two to three and so on. And, and maybe when you see it, you can't work out what it is, but then you join the dots and then you can see what the picture is. And the thing that occurred to me just for a few minutes as we share tonight is that when I was growing up, I wasn't part of a Christian family. I, we, we didn't go to church. I wasn't religious in any sense. And nobody joined up for me the dots of Christmas. I understood my, my family's context of Christmas, of the decorations and presents and, and food and traditions. I also understood really through school and other things that there was a story behind the celebration that somehow behind what Christmas had become was a story about Jesus being born in Bethlehem, about Mary and Joseph, about wise men bringing gifts and angels and shepherds. But nobody joined the dots up for me. I didn't get it. I didn't understand really why we were celebrating Christmas. And tonight, I just want to try and join up the dots of Christmas for a few minutes because we've been hearing readings from the Bible and we've been singing songs and they're all like little dots where if we join them up, we'll understand what this is about. And uh, the first thing I want to say is if we join the dots of Christmas, we discover that Jesus came to save us. When I was growing up, I, I didn't know this. At least I didn't get this. You see, we don't celebrate Jesus because he was an amazing looking baby. We celebrate Christmas because we understand that Jesus came into the world to bring salvation, to save us, and actually to save us from our sins. This is what the angel said to Joseph, who became as a father to Jesus. He says, when the baby's born, you're to give him the name Jesus, which means the Lord saves, because he will save people from their sins. That's what the angel said. This is what this life is going to be all about. The word sin, it's really an archery term, and it, it means if you are a fire an arrow at an archery target, and it missed the target and went beyond or behind, that's called a, a sin. It's a miss. And what the angel is saying to Joseph is, this one that's going to be born, he's coming with a purpose. In fact, the, the other dots, we read these, these prophecies, the first reading we had, 700 years before Jesus was born, it, it says, unto us a, a child is born, but a son is given that we understand this is the Son of God that is given into the world. Why? To save us from our missing of the mark. And I don't know about you, but I'm acutely aware that I have missed the mark. We don't celebrate this baby just remaining as a baby. And I think this is the danger of Christmas. We come back to the nativity story, and it's as if Jesus never grew up beyond the baby. Of course, we don't celebrate. You don't celebrate your lives as a baby. You celebrate your life as the person you are now. Our, our eldest son recently turned 21. We didn't get out the baby photos and recount the details of the birth, which, which probably is a good thing because it was, it was a difficult birth. But actually, we celebrate the person he is today. And this is the same with Jesus. We celebrate the person that he is today and what he did, which, which is to bring salvation. And so we sung tonight, silent night, holy night, Christ the Savior. Christ the Savior is born. Oh, holy night, this is the night of the dear Savior's birth. If we join up the dots of Christmas, if we join up the dots of the Bible, we understand a big story, something like this, that God created you, created mankind, that he loves you, and that actually his desire was to dwell in relationship with us, but that he is perfect. And because we have missed the mark, we are not. And if we were to take our imperfection into his perfection, we would spoil his perfection. And the Bible says the wages of sin, the, the penalty for having missed the mark, the only way we can resolve this is through death. But God comes and he says, I am going to pay that price for you. This is why Jesus comes. Jesus, the Son of God, comes. The most famous verse in the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. The Son of God is given that he might grow up sinless and go to the cross and die on the cross. And in so doing, take your place and my place in death 
that we might be forgiven, that we might find resolution, that we might might come through to relationship with God. And this is what the message of Christmas is about. You might ask, well, do we need a Savior? Do I need a Savior? I came to the conviction at the age of 17 that although I'd not done anything terrible by most people's standards, I had missed the mark. I was not a bullseye person and that I was a sinner in need of a savior. It's interesting. I meet people all the time who who don't have a religious context to their lives, but when their loved ones pass away, they speak about them going to a better place. They say things like, well, at least he's in a better place now, or, or she's looking down on us now. Well, w- what are they referring to? They're referring to some hope that they go to a better place, which we we'll, could probably call heaven. And I think most of us hold on to some idea that there is something beyond this life. And that good people should make it and that maybe the worst of people shouldn't. That maybe Mother Teresa or somebody like that at one end of a spectrum should make it to heaven because she poured out her life for others. But maybe at the other end of a spectrum, let's take someone, I don't know, maybe like Adolf Hitler, maybe he shouldn't. And yet the thing that doesn't make sense about this, although at that level it kind of sounds sensible, if you think it through, it's not logical because what it means is that Next to the worst of the worst is, is the next worst, and the next and the next, and next to the best is the next best, and the next of the next, and there are others and others and others. And in the middle, there's a cut, an arbitrary cut. There would be an arbitrary cut between two people who lived incredibly similar lives. To illustrate, I'll, I'll give them the names Bob and John. And you can imagine that two men lived, they never knew each other, but their lives were incredibly similar to one another. I mean, how do you judge a whole life anyway? But just a headline, can you imagine that, that Bob lived his life and, and that he was a good father to his children, that he was hardworking, that he never forgot his mother's birthday, that he, he helped his wife through cancer and he did a lot of work for charity. But on the downside, he swore like a trooper and he lied a lot and he fiddled his tax return five years on the trot. And when he was, uh, when, when he was um, in his 30s, he, he ran over his neighbor's cat and never confessed to it. Just buried the cat in the garden. Never said anything to the neighbor. And, uh, but when he was eight years old as well, he went to his corner shop and he stole a Mars bar. And then he appears before God and God somehow got to judge this life. And, and what, what's God supposed to do with a life like this? Because it's not a clear cut situation. There's good and there's bad. But can you imagine God in his great mercy saying, oh, Bob, Bob, all right, you're in. But next to him in the line of judgment is John. And John has lived an incredibly similar life. He also was a good father to his children. He also uh, remembered his his mother's birthday. He was also a hard worker. He also nursed his wife through cancer and did a lot of charity work. But he also swore like a trooper and, and lied a lot and fiddled his tax return five years on the trot. He also, in his 30s, ran over his neighbor's cat and did the same thing as Bob. But when he was eight years old, he went to his corner shop and he didn't only steal a Mars bar, he also stole a curly whirly. And can you imagine, I mean, God's got to draw the line somewhere. And can you imagine the curly whirly being the straw that breaks the camel's back? It wouldn't make sense. It doesn't seem right, does it? It doesn't seem right to me. But here's the good news of Christmas. If we join up the dots, it is God saying the truth is no one has lived a perfect life. Everybody is in need of a savior, but I am going to send a savior. I'm going to send my son who is going to die in your place, hanging on a cross that you might have life. This is the message of Christmas. This is what we're singing about. Christ, the savior is born. If we join up the dots of Christmas, we discover Jesus came to save us. Secondly, if we join the dots of Christmas, we discover the message isn't for others. It's for us. Well, of course, it it is for others. What I really mean to say is it isn't just for others. It's for us. We can come to a service like this and sing some songs and have a mince pie and, and go home and go, well, that's lovely. But actually, there's a message here that's for us. I never knew this growing up. I didn't realize Christmas was for me. I didn't get that a baby in a manger was actually a picture of God giving the most precious gift that could have been given to me. But the angels say to the shepherds, a savior has been born today in the town of David. 
This is the greatest news ever told. And then he says, and it is for everyone. Can we all say everyone? And it's for everyone. He doesn't say, and it's for the righteous or, or it's for the religious or it's for the good people. He says it is for everyone. This is the message of Christmas. It's not for others. It's for us. It's for you. Simeon, a, a godly man in the temple, is there when Jesus is brought by Mary and Joseph. He's eight days old and he's presented. And Simeon, this praying man, takes the baby Jesus in his hands and he says, now my eyes have seen God's salvation. And he says, this is for the Jews and the Gentiles, which if you don't understand, that means everyone. It's for those that are Jewish and those that are non-Jewish. And we all fall into that category. In other words, he's saying, this is God's salvation plan, and it is for everyone. And if it's for everyone, it's for you. I've mentioned John 3.16 already, for God so loved the world. Loves the world, that means you. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Whosoever includes you. You know, many of us were in danger of, of leaving this precious gift unopened. And untreated, discarded, walked past, maybe the most precious gift that you could be given, but just left for another year. And the, the invitation tonight is that you would receive the gift that has been given. In the spoken word earlier, they finished by saying, will you RSVP to the invitation he's written? What are they saying? They're saying, will you respond to this gift of Christmas, which actually was given not for others, but for you. Will you respond? We sang earlier, cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. Something can happen in us if we respond, which brings me to my last thought, which is if we join the dots of Christmas, we discover it's easier to receive than we, I'll put probably, probably thought. I don't know what you think, but I know when I was 17 and I responded to the message of Christmas, I I'd come to the conclusion that the Bible was true and that I was a sinner in need of a savior and that God had come to rescue me. And I expected it to be more difficult. I expected me to need to do some training or to, to learn some things or to go to church for a bit or to be a better person than I was. But I came to understand actually it was easy to receive. It was designed to be easy to receive. There are, there are some presents you get and they're they're hard to get going, aren't they? You need to register them or they, they, they need batteries and they haven't got batteries or a, or a piece is missing or it has the dreaded word, some assembly required. And then you open some other presents and they're good to go straight away. I want to tell you this gift from God is good to go. John, a friend of Jesus who years later was writing up his account of Jesus' life and he said this to all who received him. And to all who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. What John is saying, you just need to believe and receive. And you can have a relationship with God. You can come to know God. When I became a Christian at the age of 17, I'd, I'd met lots of people who they seemed to know God for themselves. They, it appeared to me that that they prayed and they spoke to God, but God also spoke to them. And I, I wanted what they had, and I tried to figure out, and I talked to people, well, what did you do? How, how did this, how did you get into this relationship with God? And the truth is that in some way or another, they'd all believed and received. And it really is that simple. You just need to believe and to receive. The carol we sang earlier, O Little Town of Bethlehem, says this, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in, where those with humble hearts will receive him. He'll come. And this is my testimony. I prayed a prayer when I was 17, and he came into my life, into my heart. And tonight, you can pray a prayer before we finish this service. You can invite the dear Christ into your life to experience the forgiveness that he'll bring to you, the cleansing he'll bring to you, the hope that he'll bring to you, and then begin a journey of walking with God and knowing God for yourself. This is the message of Christmas. As I finish this, 
message, I'd, I'd like to offer a prayer that you might want to pray yourself. Let me read it to you so that you know what you would be praying. It's really simple. I think it's going to come on the screen. It simply says this, Lord Jesus, thank you for coming from heaven to earth. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for taking my sin and shame there. Please forgive me for the wrong things I have done. Please make me clean. I open my heart to you this Christmas. I say yes to you. Please come into my life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for hearing my prayer. And I wonder here in the room if we could close our, our eyes. If you're joining online, you might want to respond. And, and simply, I'm going to read this prayer. And after each phrase, I'll pause and allow you to echo it in your heart. I encourage you, if you want to pray this, just to, to pray this in your heart and mean it. And God. Almighty, who knows you and loves you and created you, he will hear your prayer and take you at your prayer. Let me pray it phrase by phrase and respond in your heart if this is a prayer you want to pray tonight. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming from heaven to earth. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. And for taking my sin and shame there. Please forgive me for the wrong things I have done. Please make me clean. I open my heart to you this Christmas. And I say yes to you. Please come into my life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Amen. Allow me to pray for you if you responded to that. I thank you, Lord, that you hear every heart that prays. I pray for any tonight that have prayed this prayer and meant it in their heart, inviting you in for the first time. Or maybe some have been a long way from you and are coming back to you tonight. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, come and respond to them. Cleanse them. Make them new. Let tonight be a fresh start in their life and help them to walk with you day by day, growing in strength and grace and faith. In Jesus' name, amen.